So we're in a series during this season called Advent. If you haven't heard about a season called Advent, uh, Advent means coming, and it's a time when you begin to focus on Christmas and on the birth of Jesus and the celebration of the birth of Jesus, but it's also you looking forward to the return of Jesus. So it's kind of combined together of celebrating his birth that happened in the past, looking forward to his return, this coming. That's what Advent is, and it begins today. And so we decided, instead of doing the traditional thing that we normally do with Advent, is that we would talk about family. And that we would talk about different aspects of family. And so in particular, I'm going to talk about singleness today. And I know a lot of you aren't single. So you're like, oh, I, good, I get to take a nap now. Uh, no, this is actually more important for you than it is for the single people. Um, singleness doesn't get talked about a lot in the, in, in the church. Um, and in particular, if you grew up in a church, you know that you everything is segregated. And so you're jumping from middle school to junior high to high school, to college, to singles group, to older singles group, to married group, to married without children, to married with children, to married with too many children, to you lost all your children. Like if this is, I mean, and they, you don't know where they are, or what part of the country they're in. Like you, there are all different kinds of groups for these things, right? But today we're just going to talk about singleness. But to do that, I'm hardly going to talk about singles. What I want to do is I want to start in Genesis chapter 2, verse 18. God created the universe, and he begins to create image bearers, and he has Adam that he's created. And this is what he says about Adam. He says, And the Lord said, It is not good for the man to be alone. I will make him a helper suitable for him. Now, this text is in particular to a male, but it's actually to all of us. It is not suitable for any of us to be alone. God is a relational being. He created you in his image, and that means he created you for relationship with himself and with one another. And the, in the garden, this is something that was beautiful and perfect. And so God creates Eve for Adam, but because I only have like 20 minutes, because I'm actually going to invite a single person up here to talk about being single, um, I'm not going to tell you the whole story other than know that you all know he messed up, Adam and Eve. They, they kind of threw us into a, a problem. And so we can jump forward to chapter 3, verse 10. God, Eve, and Adam had a relationship where they walked with each other, where they were engaged with each other. And so God goes looking for Adam and Eve. He's calling for them. He wants to, to hang out with them. And this, he can't, he, well, he can find them, but in the story, they're hiding. So it, it, he, um, he asks them why they're hiding, and this is what Adam says. I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid myself. So if you've been at the village for any length of time, you know that this is sort of our theme verse, and I don't know why there's not a song for it um, about how we're always afraid and naked and hiding. But this is the mode, maybe it's too explicit and brings too many pictures in your head, I don't know, but this is the mode that you and I operate in. All human beings operate this way. We operate out of fear, and we spend our life hiding because we're afraid of being seen, because we know that there's something deeply wrong with us. There's something gone wrong with our longing and desire to be in relationship with one another. And the prophet Jeremiah clarifies for us what has happened that's wrong. In speaking for God, or speaking, God speaking through Jeremiah, he says this, For my people have committed two evils, or some translations say sins. They have forsaken me, the fountain of living water, to hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns, that cannot, can hold no water. So, all of us, from the moment that you're born, so if you're 10 years old in this room or if you're 90 years old, all of us have this emptiness inside of us and we really, really long to have it filled up and we cannot figure out how to fill it up. And a lot of what it has to do with is you and I come with the question to God and to one another. We say, am I safe? Am I important? Am I valuable? Do I have any kind of meaning? Right? We ask people this all the time, and then we base our life on what they say and how they interact with us. Right? So single people do this. 
Married people do this. Grandma and grandpa do this. Your six-year-old does this. This is the thing. But what's happened is we've rejected Jesus. We've rejected God who can give us living water. The only one who can say, yes, you are safe, and yes, you are significant. Yes, you have meaning, and you can have impact. Yes, I love you. Right? We've forsaken that because it requires something relatively uncomfortable for us. It's not a quick fix. And we've gone around digging up our own cisterns. Right? We've created our own wells to tell us that we're happy, we're okay, we're significant, we're loved. And in American culture, and since that's where I'm at, I'm going to speak to you, you guys, me included, are a bunch of narcissists. Right? We are a nation of narcissists, and if you live in this nation, you are a narcissist. You narrate your story from you. It's about you. Even when you are being kind and nice, you narrate it from you and what you have done. And here's what happens when you're a narcissist. Here's when you go dig other cisterns, what happens to you. You don't, get any, you don't have any empathy. You do not know how to empathize with other people. You've lost your capacity to get out of yourself and step into other people's pain and suffering. Oh, you can have sympathy, and you might even get to compassion. But compassion just moved to do something. But to empathize truly with someone, you have to actually get out of yourself. But so often, you and I are driven by our own story and how we experience life. You're, you're raising your hand right in the middle of my sermon. Go for it. Yes. Well, empathy is being able to step out of your own pain, suffering, and experience and step into someone else's pain and experience. All of us are in that place. A lot of times when you're single, meaning you're not attached to anybody, you're single, and I'm going to just define single as you're not married to anybody at the time, and you don't have any children, you have nothing that's connected, you're single, sometimes we who are not look at you and say, oh, we see that so much more than we see it in ourselves, right? We tend to be able to point out that and think we should fix it. But it's in reality, it's in all of us. Now, at the beginning of Ephesians chapter 6, or not the beginning, of verse 10, Paul the Apostle says this, Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the, in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Now, to step backwards to that empathy thing. Jesus came into the world. Philippians 2 tells us that he left everything behind. Jesus was fully God and fully man. He completely empathized with us. In fact, we use a theological word called kenosis, or he had a canonic outpouring of himself. Everything was poured out of him for us. He experienced all of humanity for us. He empathized. And what Jesus did in that is brought to uh, a, a tangible sense the fact that there, is two conf that there are two kingdoms that are at war with each other. And he gave humanity an opportunity to be part of that conflict. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you are not at peace. You are not in peacetime. You are born into war. I know you're all, well, many of you are Americans, but you're all in America. So you have this sense of this sort of pseudo peace that nowhere else has. And not many places do. But as a follower of Jesus, you're not part of that peace. You are part of a war, and you are born into a war. But the war is not with other people. And see, the thing is that you and I get so caught up in the conflict with other people that we don't realize that we're born into a conflict with the evils 
behind people, with the enemy, with darkness, with destruction, with Satan, with the demonic. There is a force that you and I are in conflict with and that you are born into this. And so here's where the single part comes in. If you are a single person, and that means if you're 10 years old, means if you're 9, it means if you're 90 and you're single, you are part of the special forces of the faith. You are the Green Beret of our community. You are the Delta Force. You are the Rangers. You are the spiritual snipers of our community. Right? I know some people are uncomfortable with the conflict analogies within Christianity, but we are at war, not with one another, but with a spiritual force. And you guys are part of that. Right? You're part of that conflict. Single people are on the front lines. Married people, you need to know that. Single people are on the front lines. Parents, you need to know that, right? Okay. So we're going to look at 1 Corinthians chapter 7. It was read to you. But before we get there, I want you to note some things that Paul says in the chapter. Now, chapter 7 is all about marriage and their ideas about marriage. And I think it's a poorly organized chapter, but what do I have to say about the faith and how Paul writes things? But anyways, there are three things that I want you to hear him say. Number one, in 26a, he says, because of the present crisis. 29a says, what I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. 31b, he says, for this world in its present form, is passing away. Now, some people would say that, oh, Paul just thought that Jesus was going to return, and he didn't. I don't think so. Because from the moment Jesus left, we are still in a present crisis. The time is short, and this world is passing away. And for Paul, probably what he had on the forefront of his mind was that persecution of the church was at the door. In 140, which is probably 60 years after Paul dies, as a Christian, you, and if you were captured and put on trial, you didn't get any defense. You were asked one question. Are you a Christian? Yes or no. Yes means death. No means life. Persecution of the community was on its way. But I would argue also Paul understands that though marriage and family and community are important things, there is something more urgent than that, and that is bringing the gospel forward into a dark world and being a light. And it's very hard to do that with encumbrances. And so Paul is going to say some difficult things. So I'm going to start in verse 29 of chapter 7. It says, What I mean, brothers and sisters, is that the time is short. From now on, those who have wives should live as if they do not. Those who mourn as if they did not. Those who are happy as if they were not. Those who buy something as if it were not theirs to keep. Those who use the things of the world as if not engrossed in them. For the world in this present form is passing away. So Paul is saying that there is a definite thing within his culture where people are grabbing hold of things, hoping that this is what will give them some form of stability and understanding of who they are. And he's saying, no, no, no. We don't have time for you to hold on to your wife and to hold on to your grief and to hold on to your happiness and try to keep it as tight as you can. We don't have time for that anymore. We only have time for one thing. Verse 32. I would like you to be free from concern. An unmarried man is concerned about the Lord's affairs, how he can please the Lord. But a married man is concerned about the affairs of this world. How can he please his wife? And his interests are divided. An unmarried woman or virgin is concerned about the Lord's affairs. Her aim is to be devoted to the Lord, both body and spirit. But a married woman is concerned about the affairs of this world. How, can she, how, can, how she can please her husband? I am saying this for your own good, not to restrict you, but that you may live in a right way in undivided devotion to the Lord. So that word concern can also be translated anxiety. He's saying, I want you to not be caught up in the anxiety of having to worry about 
a spouse, having to worry about your kids. I want you to be in a place where you can be fully committed to what God is doing. Now, he's very clear in this chapter that he's not pushing away from marriage. In fact, he says, if this is what you need to do, you should get married. But he is inviting people to stay in their present state. And he's saying, if you're single, you have this opportunity to be completely devoted to the things of God. If you're married or you have children, you have a divided loyalty, a divided concern. So let me talk about single people for a moment because one of the things within the church, and we're at church, uh, if you didn't know, I know there are couches and stuff like that, but in the church, single people have a lot of time, right? And so a lot of times, you know, if someone calls me and says, can you help me move? I've got to say, well, do I need to do something with my kids? That can be okay with my wife. But yeah, you know, a single person a lot of times can be like, well, if I'm not working, sure, I can help you move. Or I can go make this visit or I can do that thing. And that's great that single people can do stuff. That's true. You should want to serve the community of God and your neighborhood if you're single. And you should pour your time into that. But that's not what being on the front lines is about. That's not what being single and being on the front lines and fighting for your community looks like. I actually think it looks like two things that require your time in a different way. Number one, I want to go back to Ephesians chapter 6. Verse 18. So the passage that we read earlier, the next section of that talks all about the armor of God that you should put on. But then Paul talks about the way you practice all of what he's been talking about. And in verse 18, it says, With all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petitions for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in chains, that in proclaiming it, I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Okay, go back to this. Nine-year-olds, 10-year-olds, 90-year-olds, 21-year-olds, single people. Whoa, there we go. I even uh, was getting music for that. Dang it. I was in like a cadence and everything. Um, All of you have this opportunity to fight for your community in prayer and petition, in an alertness. Now, what's interesting here is that you are able to fight for me, for fight for other people, in that you will be doing what Paul is asking, that I might be able to open my mouth and boldly speak the gospel. That what you are doing is fighting spiritually in the spiritual world in prayer so that I might, in my relationship with my wife and my kids and my neighbors, have the courage to speak with boldness the way I should. That part of being on the, the battle front as a single person is that you're going to war to help keep me single-minded in the midst of my double-mindedness and my need to take care of my wife and kids right, and the anxieties of my family that you have this opportunity to be alert. Because if you're doing these things, you're going to find yourself in people's lives all the time. If you are fighting for people as a single person, you will find yourself in people's lives. And that will lead you to the second thing. And here's the one that I used to talk about a lot because this church was full of single people, is that the role of single people in the community. So I want to read this to you. Matthew chapter 6, this is Jesus speaking, 22 through 24. And I could preach like 10 sermons off these three verses, but I'm just going to read it to you. The eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eyes are unhealthy, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one or love the other, or you will be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Now, well, that's obvious. Here's the second thing that single people have to offer the rest of us who are married and have children, is that if we're fighting, if you are fighting for us, that puts you in our life, and you see our unhealthy eyes. You see how the darkness has crept into our souls. You see how, we have, how the division 
unnecessary one and one that God has ordained where I have to take care of my wife. But you see how I have become divided and grabbed hold of the worldly possessions, how my wife has become the thing that I hold on to, where my happiness, all these things. And you can come to me, you can come to any married person whose life you're in and fighting for, and you can say, hey, Eric, your eyes have been clouded. There is a darkness here. And guess what I'm praying for you? That this would happen in your life that you would move in this direction, that you would move out of your double-mindedness. This is what I'm fighting for in your life. Now, I know that sounds crazy, and here's what I'm going to tell you married people. You should let single people do this, but since it's not culturally normal to have a single person tell you about how you're double-minded, married people, you should ask them. You should say, you're in my life, how, how have you seen my loyalties divided? How have you seen where I have searched and dug cisterns of muddy water instead of following Jesus, the living water? Tell me. I want to know. Right? So I hope at some level that was a super inspiring speech about being single and all those kinds of things. And even if you're married, maybe you're thinking, yeah, I've, I've kind of headed the wrong direction. But the reality is, none of that, just I want you to know, disqualifies you. If you're single and you're like, I've not done any of that, that doesn't make any sense to me, you have an opportunity to start. See, we were in Luke, and in Luke 15, Mark gave a, talked about the prodigal son or the lost son. And when that son like, grabs his inheritance, leaves his father, squanders it, and comes back, the end of that story, verse 20, this is speaking of the father. He says, so he got up and went to his father. So that's the son. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. And he ran to his son, threw his arms around him, and kissed him. And he throws a big party for him. Here's the thing I have to tell you. No matter where you are today, you can step into the conflict, single person. You might have a limp now because you've squandered things or you've not walked in that direction. Married person, wherever you're at, you have an opportunity today to step into the conflict and know that the Father is waiting to hug you, put a ring on you, put sandals on you, and say, let's go. Let's do this. I love you. You're my son. You're my daughter. Right? So, Instead of trying to expand that, I actually ask Kevin to come up, and I have a couple questions for him. Caleb, yeah, well, Kevin and I, Caleb and I, Cal and I have talked about this, and because I'm old and there's this deep rut in my head, it's just it's going to take me some time to close that rut up. And you're okay with that? I forgive you. Thank yes. you. <laughs> <laughs> so I had a couple questions for you, Kevin, and then um, so the first question is. <laughs> I'm going to keep saying it. That's all right. Because, man, I just say your name all the time. But I'll sit below you so that you can, Caleb. Um, first, it's like, I, I, you've been here for three years? Yeah, three and a half years. So can you, and you've been single all three years? Yes. Can you talk to us about what it's been like to be in this particular community good and bad? The hard parts and the good parts for you, being a single person in the church community because that was relatively new for you yeah um it's probably the first church community i've been a part of so yeah new experience um i would say yeah the difficulty is it has been walking around with this longing to be a father and a husband and to have that go unrequited unmet with no real prospect of it being met and so kind of walking around with an empty cup and being around families, uh, people who are married and who have kids. I think I spent a good part of the first three and a half years feeling empty and anxious about that. Um, and then I think another hard part is having a voice with married people. You invited us a few years ago to, uh, a, a talk on singleness. Hey, single people, you should be telling married people, you know, what to do. And I'm like, <laughs> there's no chance that I'm going to go to these people who are older than me, have been in this church longer than me, are have been married for many years, 
uh, and and sit him down and say, hey, I'm seeing some div- division here. Um, I remember we were at, I was at a dinner with uh, s- several married couples and somebody said, oh, we should invite Kevin into this thing. And I was like, I don't think so. And Colleen was like, well, yeah, Eric said that we should receive from single people. And I shirked away and wanted to have nothing to do with that because that sounds uncomfortable. And um, so I think the invitation today is a lot more reasonable to have for the married people to go to the single people and to say, hey, what do you see? Um, Or maybe I should have been bold and spoken my mind. I don't know. Any good? Anything good. <laughs> yeah, really a lot of good. A- ability to, like, at any time in, of the day or night, like, be available for anybody. And to be in a, every kid's life, you know, because you don't have your own kids who you have to pour into. You can pour into a little bit of a lot of kids. And um, to, yeah, I've I've really relished and enjoyed the ability to, like, have meaningful contact with every villager that I possibly can. And I think that will diminish and go away when I become divided in marriage. So since I invited single people to talk to us, Mm -hmm. so talk to us, here's your get to be awkward and uncomfortable. And can you talk to us maybe a little bit like been here three years what are some of the divisions that you see us as a community wrestle with as people who are married at least the married people in our community i'm gonna put you on spot and then everybody's gonna ask you about it afterwards well i think it's a little unfair because yes certainly when you take on a wife you are divided against this single pauline sort of life and ministry i think of um, acts 16 where paul and silas are going around and they're preaching the gospel, and there's a demon-possessed woman who actually is seems like she's in touch with the truth, and she follows them around and says, these people are preaching the good news and the way to be saved, and she kept doing it and kept doing it, and so finally Paul says, okay, look, this has got to stop, and he casts the demon out of her. Well, there were people who were making a ton of money off of her because she could actually tell the future, um, and they got really upset with Paul and Silas, and they said, hey, well, we're going to just have to beat you now. And so they beat them with rods in the public square. And I remember reading that a few years back and going, you know, Paul has an ability to offer his body to God in a way that if he was single, I think he has to think differently. Because at the yeah, beginning of 1 Corinthians married, 7, if he, were married. if he was married, yeah. Beginning of 1 Corinthians 7, Paul says, hey, your body is your wife's and your wife's body is yours. And I know that's... I think written in a sexual context, but there is an implication to me like that you, your body is no longer just God's. There is an earthly human that you're bound to. And so your martyrdom, maybe it's limited in a way. And so, but that's from Paul's perspective. Like he's a guy who was single as far as I think we know, right? Mm-hmm. Um, And so he was able to go and have this type of ministry where he was offering his body and his time, and he just threw himself into the ministry. And he says, yeah, that's that's the way to do ministry. And he even says in 1 Corinthians 7 three times, okay, guys, this is not the Lord saying this. This is Paul saying this. So he even, like, takes it down a notch and lowers the level of truth in which he starts then offering these commands about marriage because... To me, like, kingdom building uh, the way Paul did it is great and one thing. But what about kingdom building of raising children up in the kingdom? Sure. Future warriors. having sure. Building a house that's a kingdom house. Yep. Like, that to me is this other part that's just as important yep. for the continuation of things. Yeah. You, you didn't answer my question. <laughs> what is your question? My question How we've is, been divided? Yeah. Uh, well, I understand you have a conflict of it, but you have a special... You have a special look into it, certainly, because all of us at some point in our life and for some period are called to be single, right? And I got some this, of us David, will be ahead. single. Yeah, just give so it to you. You, get, you, already, you, already, you already told me earlier, so you might as well just... What did I tell you earlier? I'm not going to tell you. You got to tell him. <laughs> I don't remember. What did I say? Well, you, you talked about some of the cultural values that you felt people bought into. <laughs> 
I want to make. I want you to make okay. them uncomfortable. I'll take the. I'll take the back blow for it. Go. <laughs> they can yell. They can yell at me. So, uh, a few things. There's a book written by David Bennett, who is a gay Christian man. He's celibate, and he wrote this book called The War of Loves. And I'm reading it. It's really good. And in it, he says, "Hey, yeah, me being gay, and." not able to marry and have children, it is a curse, and it's a curse of great magnitude if what you, Christian culture, you, Christian culture, says is true, and that is that, like, procreation and bearing children and having marriage, that is, that's the top. That's the best and most meaningful and important thing that you can possibly do. If that's true, then I have great reason to be very sad. But if, in fact, you have taken... Uh, marriage and family and elevated it above the the Pauline way of being able to serve with a single mind and have intimate union with God, then in fact, actually maybe his invitation is more rich and more deep than ours as those who are invited into marriage and family. Um, Matt Kaler, where is he? Uh, he went to a really cool church, it sounds like, uh, University Baptist Church in Waco. And what was the pastor's name? Josh. Josh gave a sermon a few weeks ago about how we kind of idolize the nuclear family and we idolize the, uh, the idea of progeny bearing children. And he's like, hey, the deepest sense of family that any of us will have will be us before the Father, being all of us kids before our Heavenly Father. So Having children is, yes, good and great and beautiful, um, but it is not above somehow um, having relationship with everybody and drawing everyone unto or into childhood before the father. Um, so, yeah, there is an idolization in, in our church and in, in me and all of us of, like, getting married. Okay, that's... Someone said uh, to me, because I got baptized a few weeks ago, and Lord willing, I will be getting married in a few months. And someone said, oh, I think it was, yeah, it doesn't matter who. They said, oh, your, your baptism, second to your baptism is your sacrament of marriage. And I was like, well, and actually I think they're right. To declare lordship to, to the Father and to say, I'm your kid. And then beneath that, subsidy secondarily to that is to say, oh, and I'm uniting myself to this woman. Um, but I think we get those reversed. Like, we don't think of marriage as less important than baptism in our culture. I haven't thought of it that way. Cool. Is that, are you happy now? <laughs> A little bit. <laughs> Not fully. But yeah. I'll go with that. That's yeah. good. Yeah. I, yeah. I mean, yeah, I'm going to let you, if you got anything else to say, and then I'll, I'll end it. Is it, are we done? Is it time, it's time to stop talking? you got a minute or two. Okay. Um, yeah, I think that uh, my own story and experience, I mean, I can talk about that for a long time, but going back to Jeremiah 2.13, I have definitely pulled from the cistern of family and marriage and said, you know what? Life's really hard and chaotic, but once I have a wife, like I will taste something good. And it was actually, I was with your dad at lunch about eight or nine months ago. And I was pouring my heart out about this woman who I was hopelessly in love with. And he said, what would you do if she walked through the door right now? And I was like, wow. You know, and I realized the next day, if she walked through the door, I would have way rather seen her walk through the door than Jesus. So I had this thing all mixed up. And I think Jesus' invitation and challenge for me nine months ago was, I can touch your longings deeper than she can. And then kind of referred me to John 6, where Jesus talks about manna, which is good. I mean, Numbers 11 says that manna tasted good. It was a pastry with olive oil on it. But Jesus says, I want you to want the better bread. So I think in a way, family and like physically holding on to our wives and our husbands and our children is good sustenance and nourishment, and it tastes sweet and good, but it's not the better bread. It's not the, the eternal bread from heaven that Jesus offers. So, anyway. I think we'll close with that. Thanks.
Kevin. Can you guys give Kevin a hand? <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, guys. Um, Thanks, Kevin, and Caleb, and Cal, and <laughs> Jeff, and Fred, and whatever else. I'm going to get used to this one day when I die. Okay. Jesus, thank you so much for this community, and I just ask that you would take all the words that were said and that you would use them in our hearts and souls to be drawn into your presence and to chase after you. And I ask that in your holy name. Amen. <laughs>